Now, from this group here, you've heard that sustainability large scale, and if you have, actually, it's not nothing better to do tomorrow morning, you've got to come to the orange stage, because we'll be talking biodiversity, and in fact, we'll be talking about the uh, Cavengo Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. They were just talking about that a minute ago. But for now, we are moving on, and this is a very, this is a very attentive crowd, small crowd, but very attentive crowd, I am sure. Uh, the power of cooperation for a regenerative future in global tourism. How do we make that happen? How does it look like in practice? Uh, we have a keynote speaker. She's policy officer at the European Commission in Tourism, and her topic is United in Diversity, Harnessing EU Collaboration for Regenerative Sustainability. Sustainable Tourism, please welcome Dr. Misa Labarile. Thank you. Come to the stage. Thank you so much. It's great to have you. The floor is yours. Yeah. It's in 10 minutes to, to tell you how the EU works. So that is an impossible task, but I'll do my best. And I'm, first of all, really grateful for the invitation by ITB because what normally happens when the European Commission speaks at these events is that um, I get very puzzled looks from stakeholders who don't understand why we descend from Brussels to speak up about tourism. And so that's why we're here. And I know we have a reputation of being in equal measure aloof and obscure. Um, and it's, this is on us, it's not on you. But that is why I'm doubly grateful for Willy and to the ITB and to the organizers for having us. Um, and this is what I want to explore with you today. I would like to be able to explain to you that the European Commission can play a key role in tourism. And we do so because we have a strategy that we call the Transition Pathway for Tourism, which did not exist up until five years ago, say, four years ago even. What happened? COVID happened. Before COVID, there was a team inside of the European Commission working on tourism, but mostly the idea about tourism was that, yeah, it's a good, fun, sector, but mostly, you know, good on its own legs, doesn't need much help from us. And remember, the European Commission only intervenes when there's a gap in the market. If there's no problems, we don't take any actions, because what, why should we? But then COVID happened, and COVID hit tourism worse than any other sector. And all of a sudden, our team, and it's a bunch of people, like about eight people, our team became very critical, and our actions became important. All of a sudden, tourism became a priority for the European Commission. And you may remember during the pandemic, we had, we had the COVID certificate. You probably remember traveling with a COVID certificate on your phone. That was us. And we took that as an opportunity to also think long term, what next? Because once you open the tourism box, then you find out there's a lot that we can do together. The tourism transition pathway is the response to that. This process that we set up so that we can agree on some priorities, take them forward, and work on them together. And it worked so well that all 27 governments have decided that these priorities have become now European agenda for tourism 2030. So there exists one, there's one. So your governments, wherever you're from, if you are EU citizens, your governments work with us. But the transition pathway is more than that because it allows you, business destinations, travelers, academia, I don't care where you come from or what you do, but it allows you to have a voice with us. And that is the big change between over, over less than five years, probably over the last three years, because this started in 2022. All of this that, I have, that I'm telling you that I'm passionate about, it's called soft law. This is what the European Commission does when it's soft. What do we do? We collaborate with our stakeholders, we cooperate with governments, we you know, make them come together and agree on stuff, and we give our money, new funding. That is soft. But it's only a piece of the puzzle. The European Commission can go very hardcore where priorities are, on some of their priorities, and that's called hard law. Now, mind this, it won't happen on tourism. We don't have that power. That remains with your governments. But hard law is what you will see every time you see there is law or regulations or fines or sanctions, and think transport, Think environment, think climate change, data economy. Think all of these sectors, you have to think hard law. And we wouldn't be working on tourism if we didn't know that these sectors have an immediate impact on tourism. So really, if you put all this together, there's quite a lot that can happen. Examples. Imagine a world in which we have a European 
sky for aviation where there's harmonized rules and there's harmonized routes. It doesn't exist. I'm just telling you, imagine how much easier life would be, how much stronger the internal market would be. Or imagine there was a mechanism by which with one ticket, you could leave ITV and go back home to your house in Rome, one ticket, that includes the buses and the trams. Amazing. It doesn't exist. We don't have it. But this is the potential. And I think you can taste it almost, that potential, if you think about your life before the roaming regulation. That's still us. That's still hard law, but also cooperation. This is how much we can do together. And I know my time is running out, but, um, and I don't want to just talk about how amazing it all is, because it's complicated. But I would like to add a sense of urgency to this. We can do so much. We can do soft, we can do hard, we can work together. But we have to converge. We have to make sure that we use this tool at our disposal to do things together because what we have in front of us are challenges that are global and they don't wait for us and they're very common and it's beyond the EU. They're like international challenges, global challenges, global issues. Climate change is only one, but the rise in energy costs, the rise in inflation, we have households on their knees and we need to have a tourism that, like in our strategy, is sustainable. By sustainable, what we mean is it is green, it is good for the environment, but it's also inclusive, it is good for local communities, and it is good for households because it works through better employment. That is our sustainable tourism. And in fact, I'm a little bit envious about this regenerative word that ITB has found out. I wish we had used it because I think it gives more of a a sense of agency to sustainability. It gives you a sense that you actually can fix something that is broken. So that's the idea that we have, and that's a sense of urgency that I'd like to add to this. Um, and I think it's already happening, because what we do is, among other things, among the, up, on top of the funding, on top of the political work, on top of helping you network through our means, what we do is, come to fairs and events like ATB to find solutions that are already happening, the projects that you guys are already implementing so that we can showcase them, so that we can track the fact that we already are on the right path. And I'm opening and then closing brackets here. One of the reasons why we're here and we have a stand in Hall 18 is that we're hoping you'll come to see us and tell us what you do and make sure that we can publish and give visibility to your projects because that's part of our efforts. I don't have much longer to speak. I could speak for much longer, but I'd like to conclude with one plea. Um, tourism as regenerative for us. Tourism can be regenerative in actually more ways than one, so not just sustainable. I want to mention this because, sadly, tragically, we have raging war at our doorsteps and what we need is avenues for cooperation, understanding and acceptance. Understanding and acceptance. And to the European Commission, that is what tourism is. So my plea to you is please be as vocal and as loud and as pushy to us, to the European Union, as much as you can. Because as an avenue for cultural understanding and for peace, tourism hardly is beatable. And this is what we believe that we can do together. So please speak up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Misa. You know what? I think in five minutes, you've made the European Commission visible to all of us. I hope so. <laughs> it's great. And not only visible, but stand. No, you said Hall 18. Is that correct? Yes. Hall 18, um, stand 505. But you can find us. We have a big flag on top of us. So there you go. You can the flag. Visit. Yeah. Thank you so much, Misa. Thank, 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 Thank you so much for the opportunity. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes, united uh, is a good word to bridge to our expert panel, in fact, uh, because we'll be discussing how that union of cooperation and regeneration can really inject sustainability and resilience into every, st every strata of tourism. And so I'm going to welcome to the stage here some excellent colleagues, really. Um, Xenia Zuhohenlohe, she is Chief Engagement and Strategy at the Sustainable Market Initiative, will be followed by, and I'm going to name all of you, then you'll come on stage, it'll be followed by Sophie Hermann, she's partner at Systemic Germany, uh, Glenn Mansik, CEO at the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance, Inge Herbrecht, she's Global Senior Vice President, Sustainability, Security and Corporate at Radisson, and we have someone online that will be uh, Sonja Storta, She's co-founder and managing partner 
of the Land Banking Group. Please come up on stage.